Thank you, Judge Waldrop. And uh, Andrew, you all have done a great job of laying out um, the basics of Roth Gary. And, and um, I'm going to touch just very briefly on some practical uh, results of it and some ideas that counties might want to utilize in um, trying to make sure they're in full compliance with the Constitution as, as um, outlined in Roth Gary. First of all, if you've um, if you uh, if you will admit to some confusion about uh, what we're supposed to do now, uh, I suspect you're in the majority. Uh, Roth Gary, as significant as it is, of course, is written by the Supreme Court, and they paint with a broad brush. You know, they don't fill in the details. They send that back to the lower courts to determine and apply. And certainly, that's true of Roth Gary. If you if you've um, muddled through those 28 pages uh, and tried to decipher um, what's in there and you see a majority opinion by Judge Souter, you see a concurring opinion by Chief Justice Roberts and concurred in by Justice Scalia, you see a concurring opinion by Justice Alito, concurred in by Chief Justice Roberts and Justice Scalia. I guess they like to concur. But, uh, and then you see a dissenting opinion by Judge Justice Thomas. Um, and if you read the opinion, you find that, uh, as I say, they, I think they do a pretty clear job of telling us what we can't do uh, and left um, a good deal uh, of work for us to do on what we can do. Um, they said clearly that thus counsel must be appointed within a reasonable time after attachment to allow for adequate representation at any criminal stage before trial as well as at trial itself. And Andrew outlined of what some of those stages are. Then, though, of course, they went on with the broad brush. Our holding is narrow. We do not decide whether the six-month delay in appointment of counsel resulted in prejudice to Roth Gary's Sixth Amendment rights and have no occasion to consider what standards should apply in deciding this. So where are we? Uh, I think um, the perspective that I come from is usually the commissioner's courts, the county, uh, it, its administration, uh, and certainly uh, we're always concerned about the um, impact any changes would have on the budget uh, and the cost to the taxpayer. Uh, we're also very cognizant of potential liability to the county. Uh, if we uh, commit violations of someone's constitutional rights, there is redress. Uh, under uh, 42 1983 that may result in damages and attorney's fees being awarded against the county. But finally, I think we're all concerned about fairness. Uh, we want to see the justice system conducted uh, in as fair a way as possible. And you know, it's, it's interesting how often those don't conflict, they overlap, as Judge Waldrop pointed out. Uh, if the uh, county had had uh, uh, in this case, um, the benefit uh, of uh, an adequate uh, representation of the defendant uh, in this case, I think there's no question that at least those last three weeks that Mr. Rothgary spent in jail uh, post-indictment, uh, that the cost of that, as well as the potential liability to the county, could have been avoided uh, simply by giving him an opportunity to sit with professional counsel who would have done what eventually was done anyway. Um, as Judge Waldrop says, we've learned all too often relying on those computer databases will, will get us in trouble. Uh, but certainly uh, anyone looking at this case, uh, the prosecutor eventually, when he looked at it, uh, the, any defense counsel would know that you'd need a certified copy of a judgment of conviction from the originating court uh, in order to even proceed with a prosecution in a case like this. That would have led them directly to the fact that Mr. Rothgary had gone through a form of deferred adjudication and that his felony charge had been dismissed and he had no felony conviction. And it would have been done much earlier. So certainly I think we need to keep in mind that fairness uh, and uh, the budget costs are not always in juxtaposition and indeed can often lead to the same result. But I'm caught, I'm caught with um, uh, trying to help fill in the blanks uh, for counties, for commissioner's courts when they ask me, well, do we need to budget more money? 
uh, for energy criminal defense? Does this mean that, that we will be appointing more lawyers sooner? Um, probably, uh, depending on what your procedure has been in the past. Uh, that may be uh, one result of Roth Carey. Uh, and I'm asked, well, what, um, you know, what is the deadline now? <laughs> what is the, the bright line in which um, uh, we must do something? And that one gets a little bit more difficult. Uh, but I think the one thing that we can say uh, without question uh, is that if we have been using a procedure uh, that uh, same as Gillespie County, and that I suspect was very common in the state of Texas, uh, that if someone has been released from custody before their completed application for appointment of counsel is determined, uh, if they've been released from custody, I suspect most jurisdictions have been saying, well, we're just going to wait uh, until they come back, and we'll deal with them when they come back for some subsequent court appearance. I think the clear line from Rothgary is we cannot do nothing. Uh, doing nothing is not an option. Uh, simply putting those folks in a stack and saying, okay, you've got a completed application, but you're out on bail, therefore we don't have to worry about you. Um, we'll wait and see when you come back. Have you found counsel? Did, were you uh, simply indigent by jail? And have you got uh, now retained counsel? Uh, or are you still uh, in need of counsel and do you qualify? Uh, that's not an option. Uh, the, to do so now will be at our peril, uh, from, particularly from the liability point of view. Now, I didn't say that if you don't automatically get those done uh, uh, ASAP that that creates liability. In fact, I've said just the opposite, that the Supreme Court's left that unanswered, uh, and that's for another day. But I am saying you can't leave them out there and do nothing with them. So what are our choices? What are our options? Uh, I think um, uh, Andrew pointed out one. Uh, the, the legislature, when it passed Senate Bill 7, um, wrote on a blank slate, pretty blank in Texas, because we had no system for uh, statewide indigent defense. Uh, so they created one. Uh, and they used terms that some are unique uh, to Texas and some are not, some are found in other states. But this whole magistration process, as we call it in Texas, is also somewhat different from what's followed in many states. But now we've got to try to put Rothgary on top of that. Rothgary coming after the statute, at least until the legislature meets again in this coming session and who knows, we may or may not get a clear direction at that time. But in the meantime, we've got to apply Rothgary in light of the statute we have. And certainly, uh, uh, I think uh, Andrew pointed out that the statute says that we'll appoint counsel once we make a determination, once a complete application is in, and it gets to you, basically, and you, through your uh, procedures, make a determination that uh, a person is entitled to appointment of counsel, that we'll make that appointment within a reasonable time under the Supreme Court rule. The state statute says it will appoint counsel as soon as possible. Uh, that's in the Code of Criminal Procedure. Uh, and then it goes on to say that if someone is incarcerated, that that's but not later than three working days in counties with a population under 250,000 or one working day in counties with populations of 250,000 or more. But then the legislature went further and they said also that uh, if an indigent defendant is released from custody prior to the appointment of counsel under this section, appointment of counsel is not required until the defendant's first court appearance or when adversarial judicial proceedings are initiated, whichever comes first. Therein lies, of course, the root of Rothgary in when does that first adversarial proceeding take place. The Supreme Court now tells us that that is the magistration process. But if you look at that statute written before Rothgary, then it's obvious that the legislature did not in, intend that everyone be entitled to a one-day, three-day deadline for appointment of counsel after magistration, whether or not they're in jail. There would be no need 
for that language. If that was their intention, they could just simply say, after magistration, you will appoint counsel with one day or three days. There'd be no need for the language that that applies unless someone is not, unless someone has been released prior to custody. So we're left in this limbo, at least for present. I do agree with Andrew that the safest procedure would be to simply take every completed application and make a determination whether or not appointment of counsel uh, is required, and if so, make that appointment within one day or three day, depending on which um, applies to your county. You'll absolutely, in my opinion, not be in any problems if you do that. Uh, I think that'll be one of the highest and most strict standards uh, in the nation, uh, and that is an option. And some of you have already moved toward adopting that option, and that may be the option that you choose. But I don't think it's that clear that that option by any means is mandated, certainly not by Rothkerry, uh, and I do not believe it present by state law. But you've got to do something. Uh, and I believe that what you need is a specific procedure in your jurisdiction for dealing with the appointment of counsel for people that are out on bail that results in their appointment being made within a reasonable time. Now, what's reasonable? Um, I think um, uh, Andrew has pointed out the hazards, and Judge Walter has, has emphasized them, of waiting too long. We know what that is. Not only might you incur liability, you may jeopardize prosecutions that would otherwise um, be valid uh, and result in the suppression of evidence. So certainly earlier is better than later in every case. Uh, but I do know that some counties um, are looking at uh, and considering establishing in their indigent defense plan a procedure to deal with these. Uh, and that is certainly one place where this can be addressed uh, and will result in a uniform procedure being in place uh, that will meet Rothkerry. Uh, some counties are looking at establishing their own deadline uh, and saying that even if you're not in custody, uh, we will complete action on your application uh, within a week uh, or within two weeks. Uh, some are looking at the possibility of bringing those folks back uh, for a, an appearance uh, on their uh, indigency status and making a determination at that time, uh, particularly if the application gives rise to some question or inquiry that's needed about their status. But regardless, I think the bottom line is clear. Uh, doing nothing is not an option. Uh, whether or not the, um, the legislature will clarify that for us come um, by the end of next May uh, remains to be seen. Uh, but uh, I do encourage you uh, to share with us uh, how you're dealing with the requirement of appointment of counsel for persons not in custody. Uh, and I can only tell you that uh, we'll continue to walk with you uh, as we try to find, uh, hopefully, uh, some better and clearer answers to these issues. Thank you.